connecting to our magic and our unique wisdom that we've gained through the trials and tribulations of our lives, if we were all living in connection and awareness and reverence to that, that this world would be a very different place and people would be happy and would know how to take care of each other. And then everything would be different. Hello, you beautiful humans, and welcome back to another episode of Deja Blue, sitting under the cherry blossom tree with one of the most magical human beings that I actually know in my whole life. Um, this queen, priestess, woman, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Man, <laughs> has been in Dissister for many years and has definitely been the sort of person that has entered into my reality and just created a pattern interrupt in every space that you are in and a invitation into peeling back the layers of a deeper resonance around what does magic mean in your life and something that I am just so inspired by this human for for many reasons one of them is the unapologetic claiming and I think that with the amount of projections and with our families and with so many different ways that we wish to show up and yet it can create so much judgment to meet someone that is so unapologetically in their groove is it calls us forward it's simultaneously really refreshing and it's a permission slip and pattern interrupt like I said so uh today we have the queen herself, Mia Magic. And let me tell you that the, <laughs> the, the, your last name is definitely living up to the full representation oh. of, I mean, what it is that you bring into the world. And if you can't already tell by looking at her fabulous outfit that she oh. chose to wear, look at this. She's like, do you even just show up? I was like, babe, this is brilliant. I was just trying to keep up with you, girl. You've been looking so sexy on all your all your podcasts, so. Well, I went into my closet this morning and I I felt like <laughs> what I put on was just too drab and drab. It was like still fabulous. But like when I'm in the presence of you, there's like, a, it's like you know, when a bird like kind of like fluffs up his feathers and like, like a peacock. It's like, <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> so I put this. It's called my snuffleupagus. <laughs> and I, I like put it. my snuffleupagus on because you're coming on the podcast today. Oh, thank you. So. Yeah. Mia Magic is claimed as a as a witch, fully claiming it, like really claiming it, and is blurring the line. And was it not up? <laughs> <If you, laughs> can't already tell with the hat. Um, blurring the lines between life and and magic, and allowing magic to be infiltrated into the mundane and into the small thing, yeah. while also being a coach and a guide and a content creator, and making beautiful movies and traveling the world, and just really sharing the message of magic far and wide to everybody that ultimately has a pulse because if you have a pulse then you are magic and yeah. so this is really a part of your life's mission is to spread that and so I get to witness you and to be in sisterhood with you and to be inspired by you and everything that you share and the unapologetic na nature that you be so thank you so much mm. for coming on Deja Vu today I'm so happy to be here and I'm just so excited for you that this I remember you like doing it in the greenhouse back <laughs> like just I'm gonna record a podcast and look at this beautiful cherry blossom experience that you have built and created for yourself it's so magnificent well, so i'm so happy to be though. here and you're yeah. in god's hands i'm in god's hands <laughs> yeah Are my favorite always? book when i was a little girl was called in the hand of the goddess uh, and that's always the the mantra you wrote the book? Oh no, my it was my favorite book that I oh. read. Tamara Pierce, shout out. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it was called In the Hand of the Goddess. And whenever in medicine space and deep breath work, whenever if I get just a little lost, I just remember and I just call myself back and say, I am in the hand of the goddess. Mm. So we're here right now. Oh, perfect. I mean, God, goddess, all the same, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Ultimately, yin and yang. <laughs> here yeah. we are. Here we are. <laughs> so I this has been something that is a topic that is so ripe in my being and it's so important to me and it feels like it feels like the most precious of gems and my responsibility is to safeguard it in my own heart not for anybody else necessarily but for me to safeguard the magic that it means to be human in my own heart and you are somebody that when I'm in the presence of that gem just 
glows much brighter mm. and like, there's no protection needed it really actually just allowed me to take my hands off of it and let it to just sit there in the room and we all just get to receive the glow and it just gets stronger and stronger because the multiple people that also are on the same page and that reality just becomes more of the default mm -hmm. and i'm just so curious for the way that you're showing up right now in all of your fabulous glory ah. how on earth did mia become mia magic and how did you in such a solid way reinstate the default of magic in your life? Oh, well, let's see, how long do we have? No, I think, well, <laughs> our dear friend, Travis Brewer is the one who gave me the name, Mia Magic, started calling me that. And I was just interested in magic. I had just done my first 5-MeO DMT ceremonies and met, seen, felt, become God and that eternal oneness, which like, you know, we can't describe that experience to someone who hasn't had it. It's like ayahuasca, you just, you got to go and find it for yourself. But I had become, through that ceremonial experience, it was a really deep intention setting and all the elements of the tarot and, and the elements themselves were present. And there was a deeply ceremonial magic foundation to taking that medicine. And it had just fascinated me so deeply. And so I started studying magic and and what it meant and what it was and really for me growing up in the redwoods was such a profoundly powerful illustration of maybe we could just call it nature or something that's normal but these beings the oldest and largest living beings on the planet they have this magic their their genome has just been mapped they have more unique pairs of dna than almost any other species on the planet they they really are magical. And so I, I had a foundation of magic that wasn't like manifestation or something we're doing growing up. But for me, the, the moment that I really started to understand what the true nature of magic was, was walking down the street in New York City. And my partner was really Christian at the time. And so he would have these deep conversations with God. And I just looked up on Sixth Street and was like, God? <laughs> and the way that the sun shone through the trees and the way that the wind was rustling in the leaves, it was just obvious. All of a sudden it was like, yes, I'm right here. I'm all around you. I've been waiting for you to reach out to me, to see me, to acknowledge me in any way. And that was a few years before I left for LA and then and ended up having the five meal ceremony. But that was the moment that things shifted where I understood that there was something else happening, even just in this world, in the everyday reality. If you choose to see God in it, it's there. And there's something maybe not larger than you, but, but greater, not to make you less, but that there is something that has expanded beyond where your mind exists in its default. And that really, that was the moment where then I started seeking and then I started asking and really being curious and doing my own healing work. And yeah, that was over a decade ago now. So it was, it was a good, good moment. That, that was the Reader's Digest version. And, and right. So you've done a really good job because it was a pretty broad brushstroke question of like, how did you get here? And yeah. Like, okay. How much time have you got for me to like go yeah. into all of the intricacies of like the yeah. many different divine interventions that have allowed me to be sitting in this conversation right now? However, um, could you pinpoint, you said the 5-MeO DMT yeah. experience. Are there any other pivotal moments for you where it was just like, it, I feel like once magic is un unraveled or revealed, yeah. it's a deepening. So there's like, sure. oh, it's like this. Oh, and then there's another layer. And then there's yeah. another layer. And it's, those, it's in those deepening moments. So, are there any moments where you deepened your relationship to magic that really stand out to you? You know, I was broke one time and I did my first candle spell that Frida, Makad's partner, actually taught me how to do. I'd never done a candle spell before. And she told me that she was, she'd been doing this. And Makad was like, yeah, it worked. I like, I don't know, she did this spell and then some investment that he'd had like made a million dollars the next day or something crazy. And I was like, I'm going to, try that. And I wasn't really into spells at that time. It was more just about like making life magical. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about Harry Potter is that 
everyone is different. Everyone's magic and skills are different and unique. That's why Professor Sprout does her thing in herbology and Professor McGonagall does her thing in transfiguration. Everyone's is different. And so I tried this spell and I made $12,000 the next day. And I was broke before that. And I was like, whoa, this is something's happening here, you know? And I, and I had followed my intuition. That was the biggest piece was that I, Frida had given me the basics. She was like, use a candle, carve your intentions into it, rub it with oil, and then dress it with herbs. That's what she said to me. She didn't give me any other specifics. And I did that, but the oil that I used was like, walnut oil. And then I went to the cupboard and I chose cinnamon and cayenne and basil without knowing what they were. And I looked all of the things up later. It's like basil is one of the best herbs for abundance. Cinnamon is about quickening any spell and like bringing that fast fruition with it. And, and even the walnut oil had this like mind-blowing synchronistic significance to it. And so that was when I was like, wow, I didn't know any of this before. And I just did exactly what I needed to do. And it worked. And, and that was a huge moment for me where I realized that this thing that we call magic is just aligning your will, your intuitive guidance, and, and your deep connection to your godliness, your divinity with like, what you want to call forward into the world and how does that amalgamation bring something to fruition or into manifestation? That was a big moment as well. I mean, there have been so many, but yeah, that, that was a big moment where like actual magic, spellcraft, whoa, I just did something that had an immediate result the next day. That was big. Were you raised in any religious background or no, so you didn't have that necessarily? No. We went to church like on Easter Sunday and every once in a while on Christmas Eve. But no, my parents had both been raised Catholic and felt really resistant, felt really like, ugh. Oh, okay. You know, so they didn't, yeah, they didn't. After that moment in New York, I came home and asked my mom for the first time at 20 something, 21 or something. And I was like, mom, what does God mean to you? And she was like, oh, honey, I've been waiting so long for you to ask that that I don't really feel like having that conversation anymore. I was like, okay. <laughs> All righty, well, I'll just uh, keep my own quandary going, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it, it wasn't something that we talked about. There wasn't any discussion about what any of the divine words meant. Like, what is God? What is the universe? What is consciousness? That wasn't part of, yeah, the, the dialogue in my family. Because with the word witch, and there's certain words that are so charged. Mm -hmm. The word witch is so charged. Yeah. The word spells is charged. Um, and doing anything that is just a little bit sort of off the beaten path, specifically around quote unquote witchcraft, it can be distorted just in the moment that someone hears, I did a spell, right? Because I feel like there's a lot of programming yeah. around... <clears throat> The witch hunt, the witch trials, um, the 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 word witch, the reclamation of the word witch, the spell casting, and where is the energy being sourced from? Yeah. And so, coming from myself, from coming from a, <clears throat> a religious background, and also um, a British religious yeah. background, it's like got that extra layer it's on deep it, deep over there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. And and in based off of certain religions, you know, witchcraft is is we, we, we've got to, you know, kill them. Like, we've got to get them out. Smoke and them out, yeah. There was, um, when I was in Glastonbury recently, there was a um, a poster from, there was an original poster that said that the devil was was in the village and it was being used through specific women that were claimed, that were using witchcraft and any witches need to, needed to be, um, needed to be told on and needed to be called forward. And so I'm curious about, and I guess it makes a difference when you have a family that's not really sort of super deep yeah. in the religious path. Um, what's the journey been like for you from not doing spell and doing a spell and then realizing it kind of works to sitting here with a witch's hat on and claiming this as part of your brand in a yeah, public way for sure. amidst 
the dogma. Like, there's got to be some arrows that have come at you, which is like, oh, at some point, or some energetic. Yeah. That you would, I, I mean, I am shocked every day at how little, I don't even hardly get trolls on YouTube. Like, there's a couple of, you know, Bible verses thrown at me saying that I'm <laughs> demonic and, but so few compared to what, is actually happening. I mean, when Layla started on YouTube doing sacred sexuality, she was like getting death threats, you know? So that has been, that has been really wild for me. And, and for me, I used to be super anti witch as well. I was like, I'm a wizard. I'm not a witch. You know, don't, I'm not a witch. No, people would be like, you're so witchy. I'm like, no, I'm a wizard like Harry Potter. You know, it's just (laughs) like, I was not available to use that word either. And the origin of them is the same. It, they all come from the same word, Vice, W-I-C-C-E, which meant wisdom in Old Germanic, or the wise one, one who sees, one who knows. And that's where all of those words, wisdom, wizard, witch, Wicca, that's it's all the same origin, all the same word. And when you say witchcraft, if we know the origin, it's about crafting your wisdom, which is about living your life and learning your lessons and how you integrate and embody them and how you share them with others, how you show up in relation to them. And so studying etymology, studying the origin of words has been a huge practice for me that's been incredibly supportive because it helps me understand how even our language has been turned against us. Mm -hmm. We call it spelling because it's casting spells. Mm -hmm. It's just the truth. The same as the origin of the word word and the word weird, W-Y-R-D, was the same and it meant destiny. So we were speaking our destinies with every word and those of us who were not going to go along with the flock or the herd, we were being weird. We were going in the direction of our fate or destiny. And so there's a lot of things that have, have played into it for me and I just... The hat honestly came, I was at Burning Man one year and this girl was wearing a hat and I, well, backing up, I had been at Burning Man many times. It was the first place where I'd really like gone without covering up my arm, my scar on my arm that I always covered up from a really bad car accident when I was young. And it was the first place where I was like, oh my God, I'm fully me, I'm free, so great. And I met this woman who was like, well, I do some pretty witchy stuff back in LA, we should hang out. And I was like, I don't really know what that means, but okay, cool. Like I'm into witchy stuff, I guess. And she's the one who took me to my first Aya ceremony, to the five MEO ceremonies, to breath work, sound baths. Like she got me into all the witchy stuff, Mm -hmm. the stuff that supports you connecting to your wisdom. And she always wore a top hat. And she looked so cool in her top hat. Always wore a top hat. Yeah. And I was just like, man, like that top hat is her magic hat. She looks so cool. And like the next year I got myself a top hat and it was definitely super magical. And I felt really good in it. And I charged that hat with so much magic and I would like wear it around. It was so cool. So I spent a couple of years like, oh, I wish I had a magic hat. Like what would my magic hat be? And then the last year that Burning Man happened as a full organization, I met this girl who was wearing a witch hat. And we went out and took these photos in the desert and she let me wear it. And the moment I put it on, something was just like, here I am. Uh You've been waiting for me. Here I am. And I felt it. I felt the conical nature of the antenna. I felt the extension of my auric field, which is why pointy hats are what they are. Even when you, for those of you who are watching the video, when you turn it upside down, it's the shape of the womb. Oh, wow. So. Mm -hmm. For women, again, our womb, mind, man comes from manas, which means mind. And so the woman is the womb mind. So it's literally placing the womb from being down in the place where it lives in our body up onto your head, directing that creative life force energy to the divine and into the cosmos. And so as soon as I got back from Burning Man, I found this person on Etsy who was making witch hats and, and ordered one. And then those were the first photos I ever had that went viral ever. Like I had been just like toiling away on social media with nobody giving a shit what I was doing, you know, like for years. And, uh, and then all of a sudden something changed. And then it was like, every time I wore the hat, that photo would perform exponentially better than any where I wasn't. And it, it's like, yeah, okay, I wasn't really big on the social media game back then. 
but it's a pretty clear statement. When people are saying, we like this, we love this, we, we feel resonant with this, we feel seen by you wearing this and claiming. And I realized how much, even in my own resistance of it and saying, I'm not a witch, I'm a wizard, that it is a word that deserves reclamation because of what it means, not just because of what has happened, but what it means. And one of the big pieces of programming, like, Hocus Pocus. We all loved that movie as kids. And when I rewatched it recently, they're literally talking about eating babies and it's horrible. It's like making these witches so evil. And I know a direct descendant of the actual Winifred Sanderson, who that Bette Midler's character is based off of. She actually was put through a witch trial and then she re-sued them. She re-sued the people that that like put this trial on for slander against her and she won and she walked away free. Her husband had died and she'd like inherited a bunch of money and they said she was a witch. And she was like, fuck this. And she won that case and became a really powerful figure in the Salem area. And, you know, that's not the story that we hear about it. Mm -hmm. And so I just, yeah, it just feels like such an important part of our history as people and as women, you know, from British traditions, like, those ancient indigenous cultures pre-Roman colonization were witches, were living in magic and living in deep harmony and connection to the earth and hiding the aisles with the mists, you know? Mm. It's it's present everywhere. And, and I just, I realize that this is not an accident that we all have this hunger for magic. And so if it means that I can support that and I can be in service to that by wearing a pointy hat that makes me feel good anyways, it's like, (laughs) okay, fuck it. Like, yeah, great. I'll do it. You know? (laughs) Do you, I mean, it's so beautiful to hear that first and foremost, the, the, the origin, the the origin of the word weird and the spiling of it, and how it is to go, you know, off the beaten path and like, oh, they're going to go find their destiny. Yeah, and how I've just felt such an affiliation with like, if you're if you're weird, then I love I love it. Like I just love weird. I love different. Yeah. I love it's like socially awkward. Like like the you know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, in those like weird moments. Like for me, it, it, there's also like an existential kink within the weird and it makes so much sense um and then the reclamation of you being in your weird and you wearing the statement of a hat and then the feedback online yeah. being we support this 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 like this resonates this is a permission slip yeah. and so that sort of segues into um what do you think will happen or will shift on the planet when individuals start to embrace their own weird because it feels like it's your part of your dharma and your mission yeah for sure i think that i just think that happy people or people who feel fulfilled one they need less right so they're not consuming in the same way so if they're not consuming in the same way they're also not attached to the stories that make us consume, which is like, you're not enough. You have to have this in order to be worthy or or you have to be that in order to be cool or to be accepted. And I think that we look at governments throughout history and, and what has happened to indigenous cultures and civilizations where they're sovereign and they don't need anything from anyone. They're just like doing their own thing as they have been for thousands of years, wherever it is in the world that they're doing it. And that's threatening because then again, they're sovereign. They don't need anything. So I, I see the possibility being such profound harmony. Look at us, look at what, look at what people who love their lives do, what they bring. They want to be of service. They want to gather people together. They want to help people heal. They want to help people grow. And the more that we all grow and the more that we give to the earth and, and, and know that she feels us giving to her and, and then she gives to us in return. And there's this beautiful reciprocal synergistic symbiotic relationship that we, I know in my soul have the capacity to create and cultivate with her. I just think that 
the issues that we have, the places where we fall, the places where we, you know, destroy and desecrate ourselves and one another and, and the planet, I think those would just fall away. And I mean, I could totally go for a full utopian you know, Hogwarts vibe, but even Hogwarts, you know, there's still Voldemort. Like, no, you don't see any movie of what happens after that, after like the forces of evil have been vanquished, you know? Okay, you see them 20 years later, like with their kids, cool, but you don't see what happens with the world once that's gone. And who knows if it ever could be, but I, I believe in clean water running through all of the places in the world where it is meant to and not being damned. It's like the way that we damn our emotions. We're like, oh, don't feel this. Don't, don't let yourself be seen like this. Don't get angry. Don't cry. You know, all of that. that's like the same as damming these rivers, which then look what happens when we dam a river. Everything below it dies. You know, the habitat is ruined. The, the wildlife goes extinct or whatever. And so it's, it's all the same. It's all connected. And I feel like we could, we could live in a world where you could, you know, bend down and drink the water from a stream because it's clean. And what would that mean? It would mean that you, you know, water, the emotional element, it would mean that you and your emotions are pure and clear. And like, if you need to cry, you cry. And then it's flowing through you just like water is meant to. It just flows right on through and everything's fine. And if the the air is the mind, like the mind is pure. We can breathe clean air. Like we're not polluting our minds or the world around us. We're just living in harmony. And that's what magic makes me feel like is possible. And that's what when I share and have my students and have, you know, like-minded, heart-centered people the way that we have such an epic community to to be in connection with, it's like, look how we are. Look how we feel. Look how we operate. And I just believe that that's possible for everyone. But it's it's hard work to get there. We're still doing it. It's not like we're ever going to stop. We're still going to keep working and striving for healing and growth. But I I do believe that it's possible for everyone. And, you know, Maybe not like full, ideal, perfect, you know, Aldous Huxley Island, utopian society. I don't know. I would like to think so. But I do believe that connecting to our magic and our unique wisdom that we've gained through the trials and tribulations of our lives, if we were all living in connection and awareness and reverence to that, that this world would be a very different place and people would be happy and would know how to take care of each other. And then everything would be different. So it, it's so beautiful the way that you explain it because I see your, see the ripple effect out <laughs> yeah. of like, it really is filling that individual cup up with the weird juice and, and letting that really overflow. And that is such a huge contribution to the awakening of the collective. Yeah. Um, and yet it's so easy, so much easier said than done. Um, and specifically with certain, you know, uh, religious or mm -hmm. um, family uh, lineage, location, um, yeah. who was surrounded by the general narrative of the country. Like, there's so many different pieces that play into um, into this into this factor of sort of like full permission to oneself and one's weird. Um, if somebody came to you and they were like a one on one client, and they were like. You know, I'm fully in the matrix, like and matrix being, you know, I feel like I'm playing somebody else's narrative, yeah. not my own pulse on my own rhythm, but I'm, I'm I'm beating somebody else's drum right now and I feel very disconnected with who I even am. But I know because I can feel when I watch Harry Potter or I watch these certain movies that remind me or like excite me that there is something within me and you are living the embodiment of the version of myself that I would like to to activate in my own unique way, how would you, or what would be the first steps that you sp start supporting somebody to unravel into their uniqueness, recognizing that their uniqueness is the source of their power? Yeah. One of the first things that obviously you and I have pretty active throat chakras, so we're, we're okay <laughs> expressing, but that's one of the first pieces it, that I always recommend is you don't have to start with the scariest person in your life. If your dad is where all of your programming comes from, like you don't have to talk to him about your witchcraft. That's okay. But start with someone that you can feel safe with and, and just express like, what is the thing? It's going to be different for everyone. Some of us say what we mean, but we would never dress a little more magically. And so 
it's going to be whatever is the the edge for you or the place where you find the block showing up the most, where you're most afraid to be in your weirdness or most afraid to accept your or accept or express your magic and finding a little way in. You know, I talked to a client last night who same is dealing with her dad just not understanding and I was like the the point is not for him to understand. What was most supportive for me was just keep going until you're so confident and strong in it in your own practice that you don't need to tell anyone about it. It's just who you are. And I think, you know, in in the matrix and in a job that you don't love, the the invitation is to find all the things outside of that that nourish you. Or one of my clients was working in a corporate job and I was like, why don't you just try talking to one of your coworkers about whatever just the the simplest thing would be to you. And she did that and turned out her coworker was a total closet witch too. And then now they're like doing rituals together because they both were trying to hide it and not talk about it. Mm. And I think that that is why Harry Potter resonates with, I've never met personally someone who had seen it and didn't like it. I've met people who haven't seen it, but like everybody likes it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest here. <laughs> and, and so I think that it just depends on what would make you feel alive, would make you feel connected to your destiny. Is that in, you know, sitting at home and painting and maybe you're just like, you've been really tired from work and and it's matrix and it's muggles and it's draining and exhausting. And so you just haven't expressed your creativity in a while. And like, that would be the thing that would make you feel alive again, or having a conversation with someone or, you know, dressing up in a way that makes you feel like the embodiment of that magical version of you or who you're destined to be. It really depends on what your wound is. For some people, it is like letting themselves cry, just letting yourself feel in a moment. What is the edge that that you know you need to just push up against? And I always say, you know, baby steps are better than not moving at all. It's okay if you just try a little bit. If if it's about cultivating your personal practice and you want to just pull a tarot card once a day, every day, in order to inform how the energy of the universe is presenting itself for you while you go into your corporate job and that's what feels right to you and you know the way that you're so amazing and devotional about your morning practice and that would be something that makes you feel alive and then gives you the confidence to keep moving forward and to try something else or do something even a little scarier or a little mm-hmm. deeper. It's it's all in service. Mm-hmm. So really it's ultimately feeling into where feels like the edge around uh, the permission that we give ourselves yeah. to uh, follow through with the thing that is just a little bit scary or this contraction around it. But there feels like a natural pulse or an urge behind it that's going like, hey, what would it like if you paid a little bit more attention to me? Yeah. And that's subjective to everybody's unique expression because we're all at different stages in our journey. And so it's really not one size fits all, but more so just based off of the feeling. Totally. And, and what your wound is, mm-hmm. you know, because if mm-hmm. you've been raised by one of those moms who like let you dress yourself, then you wearing clothes that express yourself isn't going to mean as much to you as if, you know, your dad always hit you when you cried. And so you just never let yourself cry and you've been holding 30 years of emotions back. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I can wear my emotions in my clothes, but I can't let myself express them. Mm -hmm. So everyone's is just different. And, you know, that that question does come to me in a myriad of ways through all mm-hmm. of my clients and students, as I'm sure you you experience as well. And it's just going to depend on what your deep wound is and how. And and one of my practices that I love so much, you know, if you if you don't have a coach or a therapist or a guide or someone to really help you dive into your subconscious to eradicate whatever that pattern is and heal the wound that sort of creates the pattern or is the impetus of the pattern. I love channeled writing. And I just, if it's, if it's, you know, I call upon my highest self or God or this wound of expression. I call upon my creativity. I call upon mother earth. And I just write, I call upon X, whatever it is. Please write to me, through me, anything I am meant to receive in this moment 
or anything I am meant to learn about my blockages or my challenges or my fear. And I did that practice every day for a year, calling upon my higher self. And every day it was like getting a letter from the universe and just guiding me. And I didn't always listen to that guidance. <laughs> but <laughs> when I did, I would I would see these massive shifts and results. And and I was watching myself walk forward into a new reality as opposed to like, okay, quantum leap, making one decision and like, boom, now I'm on this whole different timeline and everything's changed. And oh my God, like I just made all my dreams come true overnight. It's like, cool. You know, that does happen for some people, but I, I watched myself emerge through a portal, even though it took a while at the end of it, at the end of all these things that we do that push our comfort zones, we become someone different. And that's really the point. If, you're, if you don't know who you are, just start anywhere. And, and one of the things that I recommend for that also is tuning in with your five or seven-year-old self. If they were right in front of you right now, what would they say? What would you have forgotten? What would they want you to remember? What would they want you to do more of again? You know, what have you stopped doing that they loved so much? I mean, like when I, my five-year-old gets to look at me, there are still things that she's got that she wants me to do, you know, <laughs> but I at least get to show her something that is so much of what she dreamed mm-hmm. and she's grateful. Mm-hmm. And so that relationship between the parts of us where we get our wounds and we get our, you know, unworthiness or our disbelief in ourselves, creating harmony with that is such a powerful way to then live a more harmonious reality with yourself, where whatever situation you're in. In front of my altar, um, I had a, a photo of my baby self. I was like, I don't know, two years old. Mm. And my commitment was the only person that I ever want to impress is her. <laughs> and would she be like amazed that this like if there was two of me it was you know the young me but then the older like me now could be in the same room together and I walked in would she be activated and inspired and want to play and want to go sit in the cardboard box with me and pretend like it's a spaceship you know like am I the one that would be yeah the, the medicine and and vice versa because that's the only version of myself that I want to impress is the little girl that that saw the most magical things yeah. in the most mundane stuff, like, oh, I've got my Amazon Prime bars, like, just chuck it out. You do realize you just threw out a rocket ship. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, you do realize that, that this is a very, very sacred thing that we're doing it. And get in, we're going to Mars. Yeah, you know? yeah I like, mean, yeah. <laughs> honestly, I was, I wasn't like a belief. It was just like I was actually going to Mars, totally. ran that energy through my system. And a, an adult that could get on that level with me was fair and few to the point where I just had to play with my imagination and I would have to create multiple characters in the room that didn't exist, but I would play all four of them in every scene. <laughs> so I was like, get in. And then I would like run to the other side. I'm like, okay, but I got to go grab this thing. I'll be there in a moment. And then I like go back and be like, okay, well, I'll be here for another two minutes and the rocket's leaving. And I would play all the different roles. I even had, I remember vividly, this is hilarious. Um, I did a makeout scene with myself playing both <laughs> roles. <laughs> That's classic. So I'd be like, I wish that was on video. <laughs> and then I'd run to the other side like, oh, oh. <laughs> and I was like, it was legit happening in my room. There was many people and they were having a great time. Nice. And this was just the way that I would compensate for the fact that nobody really else could get on my level. And so when I look at this picture of my little baby self, I'm like, hey, where's your imagination at? Yeah. Because also as an adult, I feel like, you know, as a kid, worry was never a thing, right? But as an adult, like worrying, like, it's like, hey, what are you you doing with your imagination? Because Mm. that's a very Mm. strong misuse of your imagination. Hey, where's your, where's the, the innocence of your imagination again? I can imagine, wait, where's Andre at? Like, who's he with? right? Misuse of my imagination. Yeah. Or I can be sitting in the room with the cardboard box and be like, let's build holes and they're the rocket windows. And and ultimately, 
to me, I feel like children are little baby geniuses that know how to take something that is just so simple and create the most magical dimensions and reality. And they're not playing make-believe in the sense they really actually believe that they are that in that moment. And how can we keep that alive now? as adults and so this is you know like you you going deeper into talking about it and I there's something that you mentioned that I really want to unpack as well is that whether you go by the the label of witch or Mm. wizard or sorceress or alchemist or whatever it is right or none of the above you mentioned to me before the podcast and I really want to unpack it because this is relatable to everybody no matter how you identify yourself is how your life has changed since you have shifted your relationship with Pachamama. And what I mean by Pachamama, Mama Gaia, the earth, planet earth, Mm -hmm. and the elements and uh, the animals and just your relation to earth and how your life has significantly shifted because of it. Yeah, I I mean, it's once you learn about it, it's like, okay, here's physical, dense bones, body, muscles fingernails, teeth, earth. There's blood flowing through water. (sighs) There's air that we need. And I don't know about you, but I'm not plugged into anything that I can see. And yet there's electricity pumping through me all the time, making the neurons fire in my brain and making my heart beat for me. And that's light. It's fire. And so we are the elements. And then like, you're you and I'm me. I mean, We know we're all one, but (laughs) we appear in this reality to be individual, unique souls. And so there's that fifth element, the spirit, the ether. And I just, yeah, it's been one of the most mind boggling things for me to understand, okay, if I'm the elements, then there's also this sort of map and language that the universe can communicate to me with that I can understand through my own body and the body of the earth. But yeah, the more that I am committed to clean waters, like one of my weird things that everybody knows, they come over to my house. They're like, oh, can I use your bathroom? I'm like, I would actually prefer if you didn't. Can you pee outside? And they're like, um, what? I'm like, yeah, don't waste water. Don't toxify the water systems. What third world countries would be like, they're like blown away that we just defecate into clean water that other people would want to drink. And it is wild. I mean, like every other animal, except those in the ocean, you know, they don't really have an option, but like that's compost. That's organic material that can just like be recycled into the earth. And it's a kind of a weird topic, you know, like not everybody wants to talk about it, but the more devoted I have been to her, the more conscientious I've been, you know, I'm like 96% plastic free. Shout out to Zero Grocery. Not sponsored, but I would love to be sponsored by you guys. But like <laughs> my, my plastic free uh grocery delivery system that like gets everything from the oh, farmers market. Girl, it's Come so on. good. I know I'm like that's why I don't order groceries to get because of the amount of waste. It's so good. It's so good. Everything, What's even it called? the potato chips come in a glass jar. No way. Swear to goddess. What's it called? Everything. It's called zero grocery. See, now are you guys going to sponsor me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Here we yeah, have it, fam, on the Day Dot Blue podcast I, I, with over 10 million listeners. May have been embellished slightly. Yeah, but exactly. Come on, yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just, yeah. So I've, I've been like almost plastic free, super, like my whole house is on a gray water system. So all of our gray water goes out back into the earth after being filtered. And we use all organic soap and all the things. And, and I just have noticed that the more aware I am of the fact that she is me and I am her and the way that I treat this vessel is the same as the way I treat her vessel and vice versa. She just keeps rewarding me. She just keeps rewarding me. And earth, the earth element is also of our financial material reality. It, it, it does rule our abundance and our financial prosperity. And I just, it, it's just mind boggling to me. Like even everything in my house, I get at flea markets or at on offer up or whatever. Like I'm plant-based. So I was like, oh, I don't want to buy a bunch of sheepskin. So I like went online and found a bunch of people that were trying to get rid of them. And some people were like, oh, ew, like used stuff. and. When it was raining, a couple I just left them all out in the rain, got them soaking wet, shampooed them all, saged them, and like 
I feel great about that. I didn't have to kill a sheep and now I have eight dope sheepskins. You know, mm. it's just, it's like, what are we willing to do to make a habit different? Because if we look at how we, like where we came from and how we all, every single human and every member of our species used to function, we didn't need so much stuff. Like we just didn't need it. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I love this tree, you know? Like <laughs> there are so many things that give us joy and those things I believe are worth it. If it's going to give you so much joy and 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 help you become that weirder, more magical version of yourself, then go for it. But there are so many ways that we can make choices mm. to support her better. And and I just have found that the more aware I am of those choices, like just composting my stuff. I don't need a compost pile. I don't need like a crazy thing that I'm churning and like doing with worms and perma. Like, I don't need all of that. But I just put all more, my organic material in a bowl and I just throw it outside into the earth. Or there's all these amazing compost companies that will come and pick it up in order to make compost for their gardens. You know, there's just like people who are also aware and doing really beautiful things to support us. And those of us who don't know what to do or how to do it or like what choice we should make. There's a lot of organizations now that are here to support us in allowing those choices to be made more easily. Mm -hmm. And that has just been the more I like spend time finding those things and those avenues, the ways to be more aligned with her, the better I feel, the better, and and the more she communicates to me. That's such a big part mm. of magic or weirdness for me. Like I am such an earth witch and, and she talks to me and she's one of the main, those, that channeled writing, you know, I call upon mother earth, I call upon Gaia, this living being, this mm-hmm. goddess that we get to commune and communicate with. And, and she just is so much more alive to me and more sentient. And I think it's just because I'm choosing to treat her that way. I'm choosing to regard her as a being who deserves care. And, and then she regards me in return Mm -hmm. as like someone who cares for me. And, you know, it's the same as like an acquaintance outside on the street or someone that you just like walk past versus someone you love. You're going to greet them with a hug or like make them some tea and welcome them into your home. And I think that we could be doing that with the earth and that she wants to open her heart to us as well. And, you know, we just as a species, we haven't done a very good job of caring for that heart. So the more we do, the better, at least the better my life has gotten, you know, and And I think that the same can be said for all of my students when they make different decisions, they start to see and feel her in a different way. It reminds me, I mean, mean, there's just so much medicine in everything that you're sharing. And I think that it just applies to everybody. Like I said before, it doesn't matter what demographic you're in or um, what religion you are or what you believe in or how you perceive reality, but just recognizing the interconnected nature of us and the earth. And it's so easy to zoom out and be like, oh God, what are we doing with the climate crisis right now? And, And the way that we're weaving yet there is a level of responsibility and it is found in the way that we even just work with, you know, our trash or the recycling or the compost, like you said, or the way we're ordering our food from. Um, There's another piece that also like sort of reminded me of, um, which is going, I guess, you know, into the category of a little more witchy, um, which you had a video that um, was online that I think kind of went viral maybe. Um, You put menstrual blood on your face. Oh boy. (laughs) <laughs> yes I did and that is very edgy in a public way right she's like oh by the way we're taking a left turn here folks yeah. okay great <laughs> we're connecting to the earth well because I actually when you were like you know connecting to the earth yeah a part of my practice of connecting with the earth has been offering my menstrual blood con- collecting it in a diva cup and offering my menstrual blood to the earth and I say a prayer every month because that could have been life but it's not yeah. and mm-hmm. so where the, you know i would like to offer it as opposed to flushing it in clean water or soaking it in some sort of bleach filled tampon but to actually like collect it yeah to say a prayer into it and to and to 
ask, you know, or like to make an offering for everything I've ever received. Mm. And and it's built this really deep relation and this connection. So when you're saying connected, it's not too much of a left turn in the sense of like saying, uh, you know, you're connecting to nature. Yeah. And then I saw this video of you, yeah. wind and blood and, and, <laughs> and, but I think that actually, you know, that also is an extension of well, if you're connecting to the earth, you you and you're connecting your relationship with your connection to the earth is your relationship to your body. Yeah, then it's also your relationship with your menstrual cycle as well. Totally, woman. and it's, it's something, your season, huh? It's the season. It's all. Right. It's like your season every month in your body. So there's a celebration there yeah. that wants to happen, and this is like a really deep, packed topic as well. Um, but I would love to hear about your relationship with specifically with your menstrual blood. If you're open to talking, yeah, about it. totally. I I haven't done much talking about it, so this is as good a good a place as any. Abigail was the only other person that like got me. We went all the way down <laughs> into the rabbit hole. Yeah, for me, it it could be life. It could have been life, and so it also represents who you were that month. Like mm. who? How did you heal? How did you grow? Because who you would be as a mother if you did get pregnant during that time is going to be someone different after the fact. So if if you've had like a lot of fights with your partner or you guys have had the most amazing, expansive sexual awakening, like all of that every month, whatever you go through informs who you would be as a mother, who you are as a, as a person. And so for me, yeah, I, I moved in with these like crazy Hawaiian priestesses several years ago and they were just like all about it. And I remember walking over to my dear friend Dakota's house. I'm sure she would be fine with me sharing this. And we were like, we walk into her house and she's standing there with like just a shirt on and no panties. And she just has blood dripping down her legs. And, and she was like, screaming about her boyfriend it was so funny but but it was just so casual it was just so casual she like greets us with no pants on and just bleeding and I was like you know trying to keep my composure and <laughs> and we went in she had this whole little temple set up and she had this beautiful mat and a and a couple of blankets and there was just blood everywhere and she was like oh I don't go in the house during my moon I'm just here taking my space for myself. And then I read books like The Red Tent and Womb Awakening and heard about, and I also read a, a book by the author of my favorite book, Alphabet Versus the Goddess, called Sex, Time, and Power, and how our menstruation, one of the theories about how menstruation developed and why. And so I've read a lot about it, and there's a reason why we sync up, because women would all bleed together, generally during the new moon, and that is the time for planting seeds, right? So we're like shedding the seeds of who we are and deciding like who we get to be anew in this dark time, This the way that seeds are, are thrust into the earth that is the darkness. And I just started realizing like how, of course, okay, we all sync up. So of course we would all be bleeding at the same time. And oh, there was no light in the sky except for the moon. So of course, we'd want to be like ovulating and out making love during the full moon. And when it's dark outside and all you've got is like a little fire to light your path, of course, you'd want to, you'd rather be all together just hanging out, not hanging out, but like meditating and, and receiving the guidance of the cosmos or of the divine for your tribe, for your group. And especially if you're all bleeding together and all meditating together and singing and praying together, imagine what comes through. And so, yeah, these women just really changed my life. They were like drinking it and stuff. There was all kinds of crazy stuff going on there. And and I I just was like, okay, I guess this is the initiation that I'm meant to receive right now. And for me, the putting it on the face thing was big in terms of one, the uterine lining and umbilical cords are the places where we get the stem cells that you like shoot into somebody's knee for $20,000 or wrist or elbow or whatever. So I was like, okay, well, so there's these stem cells, like that's pretty cool. And it's free. It comes out of my body. I don't have to do anything for it. And I just would notice also that I, you know, I haven't had any work done yet, but I would notice that, um, when I put it on my face, it was like, it felt like Botox. It felt like, whoa, my, my wrinkles have disappeared. My skin looks vibrant. Everything looks healthy. I started putting it on wounds. That was when I was really like, whoa, something's happening. Like I 
Like I'd gotten, I don't know, like a cat scratch or something. I had like this wound on my face and I put some blood on it. And it was just like gone the next day. Mm-hmm. And it was so wild. I was like, whoa, okay. Mm-hmm. And and then I just, yeah, for me, that's one of the big things. I I It like pains me if I have to go to the bathroom at any time during my moon and and lose a drop of blood. Like mm. I always want to be outside. I'll like literally, I'm like, okay, I'm going to just like drop my blood into the earth first. And like, then whatever I have to go do in there, I'll go do. But <laughs> yeah, it's just so sacred to me. Yeah. It's so precious. The oldest shamanic uh, site ever discovered over 40,000 years old, the only two things that they found were swan wings and rocks covered in menstrual blood from pre- Ice Age, right? 40,000 years ago. It's like a long time ago. And they were using this particular blood, this holy sacrament for a reason. And then, you know, speaking of re- religion and going into these biblical stories, you know, when you think about the blood of Christ, well, we are that source. The menstrual blood is the blood of Christ. No one needed to be cut open. We have it. It's right here. It will, it, it's going to come out and emerge for you every single month. And it's from the womb, which is actually the mother, right? Like nobody came out of anybody's rib. That just didn't happen. Woman was not ever born from man because men are born from women. And I think that if God made it this way, it's somebody else who wrote the story about it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't think God wrote that story because God obviously like wrote this story where like, Man comes from woman, everyone does. And so I just think that there's so much misinformation and and even the word taboo comes from menstruation, comes from a word describing our menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. And so I just, yeah, Mm -hmm. for me, it's become one of the most sacred times. So like my partner sleeps in the guest room when I'm bleeding or like I go and stay in our guest house and, and like just... I just like to have the time. I like to, obviously I have the luxury of not working during my moon. I know that not everybody has that, but I just take as much time as I need and want and let myself relax and like drink a can and just like chill. And I am so deep in my practice on it and and the messages that come through because like you're literally shedding a part of you. So there's all this space that, that can be filled with deeper understanding or deeper connection to whoever it is that that you are. And and I, like I did on New Year's Eve, I did this whole ritual with all the blood that I'd kept throughout the year. And I just gathered all, everything I had that was dried or anything. And I just threw it all into the fire. Like, okay, this last year, all of this magic, everything that I've shed, everything that I've released, it's fully released here and now. And you know, I know so many sisters that dress their candles with moon blood and and do all kinds of different spells and and the offering of it. I mean, well, I was going to say, you're not a real plant. It's okay. You look great. But, you know, <laughs> um, offering it to your plants is such deep nourishment for them. And it's the same as like everything from our body before toilets like used to go out into the earth. And so it does, it does thrive and respond, especially like if you have a a healthy organic diet, you know, it responds well. It's like, yes, I needed this nourishment. That's like a huge reason why our soil is so unhealthy is because like, you know, the cows that used to roam in the meadow where all the things would be growing and like move things around and stamp and poop and, you know, all of that healing it just doesn't happen anymore. Now everything's separate. And, you know, I think that this is such a big and important factor for us to reconnect to because it's, it's, you know, it makes it scary and like, oh, girls are, people are going to laugh at you if you bleed somewhere or, you know, we've just all been programmed to be afraid of it and to mm-hmm. think that it's gross and bad and wrong. And it's like, well, half the population does it. And, you know, the only time that we stop is unless, you know, it's, it's menopause, but the only time we stop is when a baby's coming, when new life is being made. And I just think that that's a miracle, not something to be repulsed by. Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful to hear you speak into it mm-hmm. in such a lighthearted um, way without the the density of this topic, because, you know, while you're sharing your experience and your stories, it catapults me back to 
being younger in school and being in boarding school and, and being around the boys and in if a girl had a menstrual cycle, it was like sort of like the, the, the run of the joke of like, uh, she's she's on a period. Yeah. She's on it was called on the blob. Ugh. That, I know. It's horrible. It's a h- horrible name for it. Ugh. Oh, she's on a blob. She was on the blob and it was just like, and it was just such an embarrassing, yeah. you don't talk about it. Yeah. Like it was, you you hide it, you suppress it. It's let alone go get yourself a guest house, give yourself the weekend off, go like some candles, <laughs> yeah. drink a nice glass of rosé or whatever, you know, and like enjoy yourself while you're yeah. in your Oracle right now. Like it yeah. is so far the other end of the spectrum and yet simultaneously everything that you describe, it makes so much perfect sense. And, and I, you know, when I started to realize the potency mm. of menstrual blood, uh, I had to go through a mourning process, actually, mm. because the amount of years that I was conditioned to believe that it was disgusting and that I actually believed it was and that I watched it just get flushed down the toilet and how symbolic that relation of my connection to the earth and my connection to my own power was, it felt like robbed from me because a story that I was playing out because that's just the way it was. And simultaneously it lit a fire up in my belly that was like, what are we doing? And how can I support specifically women, yeah. but anybody really, but specifically w- women that have a menstrual um, bleed every month to reconnect to our birthright beyond the narratives and the distortion so I just want I didn't know that I was even going to ask you the question about the menstrual blood it just sort of came up when you're talking about the reconnection with the earth and it feels like such an important piece and I haven't talked about it on Deja Blue yet Um, but I feel like this is is imperative actually with our relationship with our uh, uh, monthly cycle with our relationship to the cycle of, of the earth with our relationship to our body with our relationship to our uniqueness being our power and it does tie in with all of this For sure. and also recognizing you know it's not just women that listen to this podcast but that there are any brothers out there that are listening to this podcast and um it's an invitation into a deeper level of the conditioning that that you may have received around your partner partner being yeah. On, on, I, I'm, you know, on, on her period. On the blob. On the, ugh. I've not even, I've not said that for at least 15 years, it but it is just pretty saying it. Yeah. horrendous. Like, there's nothing attractive, mystical or oracle like about the word <laughs> on the blob. It, it makes me be like, oh, mm. she's on the blob. She's just not coming here for a moment. Um, so it, there's so many different pieces that you've shared that like are really important to you know to be unpacked and really the invitation for anybody listening to this is to tune into your body or where your energy is at of like where the contraction comes up where the trigger comes up also an invitation of a deeper relationship with your own personal power and how can that look what would it look like to truly lean into your weird and that's going to look different for everybody ultimately though you talked about it you zooming out on the meta perspective of how us tuning into our weird is also significantly going to shift the consciousness and the direction we move as a humanity and as a whole. Um, so there's so many, so many d- delicious fruit that you've shared today. Um, I am going to put you on the spot for a second. Okay. Not that I may have already done so already. I don't know. Um, if your microphone was linked to um, a global network, so all of the radio stations, all of the TV uh, shows and you basically are like the president which kind of like interrupts everybody's tele- uh, programming to deliver a 30 second message to humanity <laughs> what would you say that you are worthy of all the deepest magic you've ever imagined anything you thought might ever possibly be you can create 
You are worthy of healing. Breathe into your body. Feel the earth. Feel the trees. Feel your bones like the stones of the mountains. Feel the water of the blood inside of you like all of the sacred rivers. Feel that breath, the winds of change blowing through your mind. Tune into the fire that makes your heart beat and just remember that you are one with all that you see before you. And there is so much magic all over this world that is just waiting for you to discover it. I mean, I was like, if you're going to give me 15 minutes, I'll like put them into a trance and we'll do a whole <laughs> elemental meditation. But if I only got 30 seconds. I want to tell you what, we can do that in the Patreon. Oh, cool. Yeah, have I got a Patreon? Oh, cute. And so it's sort of like behind the scenes, backstage oh, access cute. that you can't oh, access here on the podcast. But nice, we can like do that. like a little bit of a 15 minute like, magic. Great. In the podcast, uh, in the Patreon. So if you're not a Patreon member um, and you want to support Deja Blue because Deja Blue has brought a plethora of free information for you and supported you in shifting into the highest timeline of your essence, <laughs> then come on over yeah. and join Patreon. <laughs> what are we doing? Yes, and then we right. get to a little bit of behind the scenes with Mia Magic. That's right. Um, before we close out, I just want to um, understand your platforms of how people can follow you and what your name is online and all the things yeah. and if you have any offerings coming up or anything I do I do I have so everything is Mia Magic M-I-A-M-A-G-I-K nod to the ancient Egyptians that's my only Instagram M-I-A-M-A-G-I-K and YouTube as well and I have Witch School and Witchy Rich which are amazing little microdoses. Remember that Hogwarts is a seven-year process. So these are really beautiful, fundamental and foundational explorations into living a magical world and utilizing healing and elemental wisdom to attract and manifest financial prosperity into your life, if that's something that you're looking for. And coming up, I do have a new program called Sorceress, Ooh, but like nice. the source, S-O-U-R kind of sorceress. And so I am super excited about that. So just a much deeper exploration into sourcing your own magic and being full of that source energy and its daily practices and really, yeah, deep communion with our blood, our sensuality, our relationship and connection to the earth. And I'm very excited about it. I've been, I've been doing my little Professor McGonagall thing and I'm like, yes, and there's more. <laughs> so yeah, it's a really deep, the, the transmutation, the transfiguration, the transformation element of, you know, I love Minerva McGonagall, bless her heart, you know? And, and I think that that's really that interpersonal alchemy. And so that's what we'll be that will be coming very soon, which I'm excited about. Amazing. So yeah. people can get more information just by following you through socials and whatnot. Socials, yeah, everything. Website, YouTube, and all channels are just Mia Magic with, and you're, with a K. You're creating YouTube videos now. I am, yeah. I've been I've been making YouTube videos. My YouTube's doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. It's really fun. And it's so great. I love, my, one of my favorite things about YouTube is that people are so open to me literally just like sitting in my house and sharing with them some part of my journey that's been really supportive in order to support them on theirs. So right. it's been really, it's such a gift and such a blessing. And my, my fans there are just so wonderful. And that's where I've been so surprised that I've, I've gotten so little backlash and so few trolls. It's, it's been pretty miraculous and I'm super grateful. It's a great community. Mm. Well, I mean, it sounds like the people are ready. Yeah, the people are ready. To I think tap they into are. The magic. I know. Come yeah. On. So I'm going to make another round of my European adventure show this summer, which I'm super excited about making modern magic. And yeah, I'm actually in the process of writing. I have a script that I wrote for a scripted show about awakening that I personally think is going to be dope. So <laughs> the goddess wrote it through me. I painted my fingers in moon blood for every single moment I would sit down to type. I would just like every finger. I was like, let me use my creative life force energy to channel whatever is meant to be read, written, and Embody. Uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, Literally magic laced in every letter. Yeah. 
beautiful. Well, yeah. you're up to some incredible stuff. And I just really believe in your life's mission, your dharma, what it is you're here to create and how you're here to activate it. And it really is just happening just the way that you are being. So even if you didn't have all of these plethora of beautiful offerings, you're still already living in your dharma. And so Thank these are really just cherry on top of the cake and the icing to what it is that you be and who you be and how you weave and how you share the magic so freely with so many people and claim it so deeply so that we can uh, all of us get to receive the permission slip for our own unique magic that we have within us. Thank you, my love. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Of course. Yeah, it's like, you know, the Christians were missionaries. I'm a per-missionary. Mm. That's what yeah, we're doing over here. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Oh, good. Consider this your invitation to Hogwarts, right? Yeah. You're you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Oh. All righty, so beautiful humans, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Deja Blue. If you resonate with this message, if you feel like it sparked something in you, if it activated a curiosity that you want to share and you feel like others would benefit from this message, then please share it on your Instagram stories, tag myself and at Mia Magic, and we can be able to together spread a much bigger message much further and farther and to allow this uh, permission slip of weird and this mm -hmm. invitation to Hogwarts to <laughs> be able to reach many more people. So thank you so much for tuning in. And if you want to see some of the behind the scenes with Mia, then go over to our Patreon and sign up. And then you can also support the ecosystem of keeping Deja Blue alive. And in the meantime, until next week, sending you so much love and may you give yourself the full permission for your whole weird freak flag to fly far and wide and be a permission slip for all of those around you that are blessed enough to receive your unique magic. Mm. Sending you so much love. Until yes. next time. <laughs>